This is the tenth in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential systems. In this lecture, we want to see how to start from a tableau and arrive at differential equations. We want those differential equations to somehow be ones we can at least locally solve, and so uh, we'll be able to to show that um, that the cartan kähler theorem is really uh, naturally predicted by unraveling the tableau into differential equations. So we start off with a tableau, which we assume is written in terms of one forms, theta i a's, omega i's, and pi alpha's. And we want to unravel it into differential equations. We'll borrow and we'll absorb torsion, if possible. So we assume that, it, that, it, that it's written in that form with, the, with the, as much borrowing as can be done. Um, and then we'll try to uh, write it out in coordinates. So we'll pick some coordinates, and they can be pick, picked arbitrarily. We'll call them u a's, corresponding to the theta a's, x i's, corresponding to the omega i's, and u alpha's, corresponding to the pi alpha's. Already there's a bit of a curiosity there. Why are we thinking of the thetas and the pi's as being the same sort of variables? But we really want to say that the, the omegas intuitively correspond to somehow to the to the variables that will be independent, and then the dependent variables be everything, will be everything else. So, um, so what we want to do is to make sure that at one particular point, the thetas, omegas, and pi's are expressed as, let's say, d u a's, d x i's, d u alpha's, just at one point, and at one particular integral element at that point. So we won't worry about what happens in, uh, away from that point. But of course, at nearby points, they'll have nearby values, and so. Um, we 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 will you know somehow get the thetas, omegas, and pi's nearby, or are given by uh, altering those expressions by terms that 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 should have some that should vanish at at that point. Um, nearby, we can still assume the omegas are in fact dx's. Why is that? Because the omegas really only have to satisfy some kind of linear independence condition in order to make sure that we're still uh, absorbing torsion and borrowing correctly. Uh, we don't really need to worry about anything other than that they should be uh, near, nearby uh, differential forms. So if they're arranged to be dxi's at one point, those same dxi's will remain linear independent nearby, and they'll still work as omega i's. So we don't really need to worry about that. We can just assume the omegas are exactly dx's. Now, um, the problem is, of course, that the pi's are a horrible mess. and and presume the thetas as well. They can be very, very messy nearby. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. But uh, what we can do is just to allow them to be chosen so that we've somehow borrowed an absorbed torsion, and we won't really worry about anything other than that. Uh, we can allow them to be as messy as they like. So, But we, now we'll just plug in, just like we did last time, we'll plug in that the pi's are some multiples, p's times omegas. And then we'll try and figure out what equations on those p's give us integral elements. So those equations we saw looked something like this. That we, we found that there were, at least among our equations, there were equations that would express the negative grade coefficients in terms of positive, semi-positive grade coefficients. So, um, so that somehow still works, that the integral elements are parameterized by um, setting the p's to be the pi's to be p's times omegas and then solving some equations for the p's among those equations we found maybe not so, these aren't all the equations but among our equations are some equations that tell us how to write the negative grade p's as functions of the other variables the x's the u's and the semi positive grade p's okay now that means we should be able to solve for what um, somehow or other we should be able to solve for the du uh, i's uh, uh, corresponding, so each u i here corresponds to some pi i, some pi's polars in the co in column i, right? Each of those pi's will have some non-zero multiple of of d u i in it, and so we'll be able to solve for d u i d x greater than i's as some function of x's, u's, and d u j's d x less than or equal to j's. That makes sense because we had exactly that expression for the p's, and since the pi's are p's times omegas, and at the, at one particular point the pi's are exactly the u's, the du's, it means that at nearby points you can solve for the du coefficients in terms of the, the corresponding pi coefficients and vice versa. Uh, 
okay, by implicit function theorem. So it means that somehow, again using implicit function theorem, it's possible to solve for these derivatives for any uh, integral uh, element. Um, so the integral elements will somehow be expressible as having this kind of equation on them. In other words, integral manifolds will have to satisfy differential equations that look like this. Now they may also have to satisfy some additional differential equations which could be expressed entirely in terms of those semi-positive grade derivatives duj dx less than or equal to j. Okay, so it's just an implicit function theorem a computation that tells us that if we had an integral manifold it would have to satisfy this kind of equation because it would have to get the pi's to be some multiples p's times omegas you'd have to plug them into the tableau and get zero and that would give you equations on the p's and then the p's and u and the various derivatives of u's with regard to x's had to be multiples of each other on each integral element that comes from some integral manifold so every integral manifold would have to satisfy these and we could in principle calculate out what these have to be by using uh, an, an implicit function theorem computation. So this is what this is what would have to what, would, what the the differential equations have to be that uh, that would be uh, forced on on our integral manifolds by the equations we had already on integral elements. Again, there could be some additional differential equations because there could be some additional equations on integral elements. We've not assumed in volutivity every integral manifold solves these equations. We've really only assumed that we had an exterior differential system whatsoever and that it had a tableau. Um, so as long as it's representable by a tableau locally, and we can see that that's actually true, for example, for all involutive systems, but it's also for, true for other systems that they have tableau. Many of them have tableau. So um, not all systems have tableau as we've defined them, but um, those which do will have some kind of differential equations like this satisfied by all their integral manifolds. We've not assumed involutivity, but we can see that we have a collection of differential equations coming out, um, and if the system's involutive, those are precisely the differential equations that are satisfied by the integral manifolds. So involutivity is that there are no more equations besides these ones. These are the differential equations of the integral, of the integral manifolds. Uh, let's pick it, uh, some initial values for those. Each ui is uh, picked to be a, an arbitrary function of x1 to xi and setting the additional x's to zero. We can assume we're working around the origin in, the, in our coordinates. So, um, so this is si functions of i variables, which is exactly what cartan kaler theorem uh, predicts. Okay, so what we want to do is to show that that will somehow give rise to an integral manifold. We want to say that if we pick the initial values of ui depending on only on the variables x1 to xi, then we'll get an integral manifold with those initial values. The cauchy kovalevsky theorem <coughs> does come into play here. It does say that the differential equation I wrote on the previous slide has a local solution with this much initial data. You get to pick this initial data and then you can carry out the construction of the ui as a function of xi plus 1, and so on and so forth, in terms of that initial data. So we have a local, so local solvability. Uh, so there should be a local solution to these equations at each step. We've written down some differential equations, and we've, we've shown that, that at each step we can, we can extend our integral element, integral manual, to the next dimension. The problem is it's not obvious that it's still an integral manifold. Let's go back and look at why. That we take the first differential equation that arises in this, in this sequence. It solves for u0, which again could be several variables, the grade 0 variables. In other words, the u0 variables are the ones correspond to the various thetas. We have these theta a1 forms, and at what a point, the theta a is equal to dua. Those duas are, of course, the exactly the, the variables u0. u0 is a column vector whose entries are the various uas. Uh, but uh, we can think of it as if it was just one variable. So we have actually solved for u0, all those variables in that u0 uh, column vector, we've solved along the x1 axis from initial values at the origin. You get to specify u0 as a function of no variables, in other words, as a constant, and then you get to extend it along the x1 axis by solving an ordinary differential equation. Okay, now that's fine. At least the local solvability is not a problem for ordinary differential equations. 
the problem arises then when we try to make it, it into the next uh, size of integral manifold, we want to produce a, an integral surface. So the second differential equation we have not only solves for u0, but also solves for u1, and it solves for them as functions of x1 and x2. It starts with the initial values which we already constructed uh, for u0, and arbitrary initial values for u1 along the x1 axis. We'd already solved for u0 along the x1 axis. We get to pick u1 as a function of x1, and then we push forward using our differential equation. We have a differential equation for derivatives of u0 and u1 as functions of x2. And so we push forward along the x2 axis, we push forward the x2 direction, okay, from those initial values. Right, so now what we've done is to construct a surface. We started with a point, we constructed a curve, now we've constructed a surface. The problem is whether or not it's an integral surface. The question really arises when you now go along the x, um, a lot the x1 the parallels to the x1 axis if you fix a value of x2 and go along a parallel to the x1 axis is the first differential equation still satisfied by u0 at any constant value of x2 so what do that what does that mean we we want we have an exterior differential system which has various one dimensional integral manifolds and and we found that they have that all the integral manifolds have to satisfy a differential equation for u0 in terms of x1. and But th those have to be satisfied any, at any constant value of x2. So what we've done is to, is to start with, an, with a point, we've constructed an integral curve out of it. Out of that we've constructed a surface. And we know that if, that if there were to be an integral surface with the given initial data, this would have to be it. What we don't know is that this really is an integral surface because we don't know that it keeps on being uh, composed of integral curves. Okay, it doesn't. It's not clear that that it's made out of integral curves. It's clear that if there were an integral surface, we would have constructed it. But it's not clear that in fact it, its its various constituent curves are still integral curves as we go out, because we still have to manage to satisfy a differential equation in x one as we travel along as we produce this surface using the x using differential equation the x two variable. And this is the problem. This is the fundamental problem that makes the story very difficult. We've got to make sure that at each step we're consistently continuing to solve the differential equations that we solved the previous step. And that's not immediately obvious in, in the story that we've constructed so far. It's not clear why this produces an integral surface. Okay, so our summary is we've uh, actually predicted our dimension again uh, as the right dimension. We see the initial data coming out uh, as expected. Our predicted dimension is justified because we know that it's the right dimension for constructing integral, uh, generic integral elements of each stage being sitting inside integral elements in the next stage, the next dimension. So we know why that should be the predicted dimension. We know that it should ensure that these differential equations we've got, we've written down, are the only ones we need to satisfy. Okay, so we've been able to turn the exterior differential system into differential equations in coordinates. And we know that those differential equations are the only ones we have to satisfy, and that that corresponds exactly to involution. Uh, involution tells us that there are no other differential equations besides the ones we've written down. And we know that the solutions depend on the predicted initial data. At least we can say that they, they couldn't depend on anything more, because at each step, we've constructed the most general solution of our differential equation as being one that depends on that initial data. So there's no way you could have more initial data than this. It's not clear, however, that we've actually done it, that we've actually produced integral manifolds. We don't know that, that the resulting objects are integral manifolds, but we know that if we had an integral manifold, that's how it would have to arise. So we have uniqueness of the integral manifold with given initial data. If there were two integral manifolds with the same data at each stage in the construction, they'd have to be exactly equal because the uniqueness at each step is, 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 uh, is, is a consequence of the cauchy kovalevsky theorem. What we need to prove, though, is that, the, is that involutivity somehow implies compatibility of those equations, and that's not obvious. We need to see that the differential equations we've constructed, when we solve them uh, step by step, uh, at each step they force the previous differential equations from the previous step to continue to be satisfied, and that's not obvious, um, and that's what we'll need to prove next time.